All right, well, thanks so much. Um, our first panel on grand strategy already engaged the key role of domestic politics in a couple of key ways. We have some really interesting questions that were raised. Does polarization render grand strategy impossible? Does domestic public opinion uh, now incentivize a more restrained and realist foreign policy? Uh, and a fickle public means the president simply must hedge in their strategic choices. This panel tackles these questions more directly, examining how domestic pressures have affected and limited the toolkit that the U.S. Uh, draws on to address national security challenges, and what role have Congress and the courts played uh, in shaping our response and the look towards the future. So if we could, maybe we'll start off with the, uh, the Congress folks. We'll have uh, Andy and Will, and I will discuss those two papers uh, at the end, uh, and then we'll uh, hear from uh, Andy and Vide. Uh, Sarah will comment on those, and then we'll open it up for the entire panel for discussion and thoughts. So uh, Andy, if you want to do it. Well, I think our, uh, I will have some overlap with Will, I think, as we move through, um, thinking about especially the uh, ability of Congress to act and the likelihood of action in given context. So, uh, how to kick this off? Uh, what I've written about largely here is an offshoot of a project that began really eight years ago or more. Uh, came out in 2005, the new imperial presidency, beginning to think about ways in which efforts to constrain the presidency by Congress uh, in the 1970s especially had fallen apart over time. And this had accelerated uh, with the post 9-11 war on terror, but it did not begin there. Um, and so that's not a bad book for thinking about war powers as part of that book, but not all of it. Uh, but war powers are obviously important, and if we begin to think then about authorizations for the use of military force, this is obviously a, a good time to do that in the wake of the end of the Afghanistan war. Um, in 2001, just a few days after the 9-11 attacks, September 14th, really three days after, uh, Congress uh, overwhelmingly, of course, passed uh, a very broad delegation of authority to the president to pursue those attackers and to respond. Uh, in so doing, they self-consciously uh, referenced the uh, Gulf of Tonkin uh, resolution from 1964 uh, in a negative way. Uh, that was a blank check. They were not going to provide a blank check huh. in, uh, in 2001. Um, intriguingly, by the way, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution itself was based on earlier authorizations uh, in the 1950s with the Johnson the majority leader uh, and minority leader in the Senate in the 50s, and uh, that helped craft, uh, for example, the authorization of force uh, for Formosa, one, uh, and uh, the Middle East. Uh, by the way, the 1957 authorization for force in the Middle East is still on the books. Uh, okay. Yeah, and uh, it, it uh, expires when, quote, the president shall determine that the peace and security of the nations in the general area of the Middle East are reasonably assured. So that's coming any day now. Uh, in any case, the uh, so we had this model of authorization. Uh, Gulf of Tonkin expands on that, and of course, go back and see who thought that that would turn into the full blown conflict of Vietnam. Um, but in any case, it did, and that's repealed in 1971. That's the last time that an authorization was repealed. It was now 50 years ago. And so, um, again, the, the model of a blank check, very much in disfavor, the rhetoric at least, of 2001, uh, but ultimately I think we could argue that that's what has occurred, right? The uh, idea that Congress was in fact reigning in the president in any serious sense in 2001 has proven to be wrong. Uh, and so I wanted just to talk about two broad points, um, and I guess the blank check metaphor is not a bad way to organize them. Uh, one is the granting by Congress of delegated power um, in a way that uh, doesn't lead to very many limits. The second, sort of the flip side of that, is presidents' uh, willingness over the last 20 years plus to write their own checks, to forge them maybe, uh, if they are not really authorized uh, by statute. And so these two flip sides, right, and they come to a, a sense of, uh, of statutory interpretation, really. One, uh, a very generous reading of especially the 2001 uh, AUMF, but also the Iraq uh, AUMF in 2002, 
Uh, and then the flip side being a very restrictive reading of especially the War Powers Resolution from 1973, one of those efforts in the 70s to rein in the president, a failed effort, I think, on most fronts. And secondly, though, Article One itself, the very definition of war in the constitutional sense. And so I'll just talk briefly about uh, each of those. Um, on the first side, 2001 AUMF was brought, there's no question. The president was given power to determine who had attacked the United States and to respond uh, using all necessary and appropriate force, uh, not only to uh, respond to those who had planned, authorized, committed, or aided, or harbored those who had done those things. Uh, the treacherous violence, as the resolution said of September 11th, um, uh, but also to uh, prevent any future acts of international terrorism against the United States. Now, there's a whereas clause, I think, at the beginning, but nonetheless is uh, uh, something that Congress granted. And again, the phrasing is, as he determines. And so there is a real handing over of that. That said, uh, over time, uh, that language, which is directly linked to the September 11th attacks, has been expanded to serve as legal justification for the use of force in a lot of different places. Uh, maybe most uh, notably against ISIS, uh, where uh, that is a group that did not technically exist in 2001. Um, and there's a sense of uh, expanded legal interpretation that leads to uh, associated or successor forces. It's not quite clear how many degrees of separation you have to have from 2001 Al-Qaeda to uh, justify the use of the 2001 AOMF uh, legally, but uh, clearly it's more than one uh, because that has now been used as well uh, in various countries in Africa, to Al-Shabaab, uh, in Libya, uh, Djibouti, Somalia, Yemen, um, Syria, these are all places uh, under the aid of umbrella, at least the last time that um, that list was publicly available. As of 2021, Biden administration's latest report, uh, all of the uh, list of groups uh, covered in their opinion by the, the 2001 AUMF is now in a classified annex of that report. So um, somebody here may have access to that, but I do not. Um, again, the AUMF even served as a justification for using force against the Syrian government itself, which obviously has done many bad things uh, in the last number of years, but was not responsible for the 2001 attacks. Uh, and that was, again, through a little bit of extension uh, logic, the Trump administration, in this case, had shot down a Syrian bomber. Uh, it's separate, by the way, than the, about, from the attacks about chemical weapons, which I'll come to in a second. Uh, but then the argument was that the American forces would not be in Syria if not for from ISIS, and therefore taking any, quote, necessary and appropriate measure in support of counter ISIS operations was warranted, even if that was military action against the sovereign state. So uh, it's a very flexible uh, piece of legislation as it has turned out over time. Um, the 2002 AOMF on my case in passing, uh, which obviously was to justify, uh, uh, sorry, to underlie the, the legal justification for the 2003 onwards war in Iraq, um, it's hard to read it as being applicable to uh, the use of force within the borders of that nation once the Saddam Hussein regime had been removed, uh, unless it has been, uh, and indeed uh, was used as the justification for the uh, uh, killing of uh, General Soleimani near Baghdad in uh, early 2020. Uh, again, uh, that may have been a, a worthwhile uh, piece of policy, but it was not one that was arguably justified by the existence of the 2002 AUMF. Uh, so we have very broad readings on the one hand of the authorizations that have been passed. Um, on the other side of the coin is the very narrow reading of other pieces of legislation, and even again, as I mentioned, of Article One of the Constitution. Uh, obviously, the War Powers Resolution, we could spend all day talking about its failings in terms of drafting, uh, especially, and some of uh, problematic provisions, uh, but broadly speaking, it requires legislative approval to introduce U.S. troops into hostilities, uh, except under certain conditions. Obviously, it's approved by a declaration of war. Now we've been had a declaration of war for eight years now, uh, but uh, also under uh, authorizations in statute. So clearly, 2001 and 2002 would apply 
there, indeed, were re- the War Fire Source Resolution was referenced in the debate uh, over both the 2001 and 2002 AUMFs. Uh, but the other piece is effectively the uh, old line about repelling sudden attacks. You can use force in self-defense. And so uh, over time, the War Powers Resolution has generally failed to stop prisons from using force unilaterally, but at least has usually forced a fig leaf of justification saying, well, this is in self-defense in some way. Um, and or uh, helps to have sort of the moral authority, though not the legal authority, of treaty obligations, for example, through NATO, through the UN, uh, another sort of common addition, uh, the Grenada uh, invasion, for example. 80s was justified by a combination of uh, U.S. lives in danger in Grenada from through there, and also a uh, request from the Organization of American States. Uh, now again, the War Powers Resolution specifically rules out using treaty obligations uh, as an independent source of legal authority separate from congressional approval uh, with regard to hostilities. So two pieces of this, right, again, um, this is not meant to be a fervent defense of the way the War Powers Resolution ever worked, but uh, even that has been scaled back recently, uh, notably by the Obama administration, originally in Libya, uh, when uh, that operation uh, started to drag on and it was going to go past the, the clock allowed by the War Powers Resolution. Uh, the response of the Obama administration was not to get authorization from Congress for the continuation of that uh, engagement, but rather to say, well, actually, the War Powers Resolution talks about hostilities, and this doesn't count as hostilities. Uh, uh, there are a couple arguments. One is, well, hey, they're not firing back on our troops, and therefore they're not in hostilities. Uh, you know, I suspect <laughs> it's a not a workable definition long term. Um, but nonetheless, the uh, that was uh, part of the argument. The other part was, frankly, a, a sense that as, um, I'm trying to find the quote from President Obama himself, uh, arguing that uh, hostilities only applied to wars on the scale of Vietnam. Quote, half a million soldiers, tens of thousands of lives lost, hundreds of billions of dollars spent. And so uh, that was, uh, frankly, a, an opinion that uh, President Obama spent some time doing some venue shopping for, uh, looking around some of the different legal branches of the executive. Um, OLC actually was not on board with that particular interpretation. So the State Department was, uh, ironically, Harold Coe, who had written the whole book saying well, this was a bad thing uh, when Reagan did it, uh, relied on those legal justifications to argue from the State Department's perspective that in fact, uh, hostilities could be defined by the executive branch in this manner. Uh, White House counsel, not too surprisingly, was also on board with this. Um, so there was some legal justification here, uh, but uh, gives a little bit of insight into the efforts by presidents to find, you know, in this marketplace of legal ideas, uh, justification that they want, um, irrespective of perhaps whether it can be supported externally. It did not get hugely uh, positive external views from uh, those outside the government. Uh, the other aspect of this, though, and it's related, is a uh, set of decisions that does come from the OLC regarding uh, what counts as, quote, war in the constitutional sense. Now, Article 1 clearly says that uh, war must be declared by Congress. Uh, now, people over time, John Yu, for example, uh, most notably, uh, wrote a whole book arguing that, well, declaring war actually has nothing to do with making war. It's a a little bit of paperwork that goes back and forth. It's a formalization of a fact rather than an actual uh, activation of any kind of new state of affairs. Um, anyway, that, but you don't need that necessarily to argue, as the Office of Legal Counsel has done, um, that in fact the uh, state of war, again, uh, means, quote, prolonged and substantial military engagements, typically involving exposure of U.S. military personnel to significant risk for a substantial period, unquote, and that presidents can use force in those situations whenever they find a, quote, important national interest in doing so. Now, presidents have not had any difficulty in meeting those bars, as you can think. Um, and so uh, 
that was used ultimately to buttress the 2011 uh, action in Libya, but also uh, justified the 2017 and 2018 uh, airstrikes in Syria to punish that regime for having used chemical weapons. Um, and so uh, Obama's policy, I think, had developed that originally. Uh, he ultimately did not use airstrikes, though having threatened to do so. Uh, President Trump, having, as Mr. Trump, criticized Obama quite vociferously for even thinking about attacking Syria. Uh, the Twitter is still out there. Uh, Trump Twitter, trumparchive.com. Uh, it's not on Twitter, obviously, anymore. But the uh, OLC uh, 2018 opinion is probably the best statement of this. One interesting thing about that opinion and others is that uh, while it's sort of drenched in citation, um, it's always almost always self-citation, right? It's very, uh, as an academic, you know, this thing's right, it's, uh, it's the academic who just can't stop citing himself, right? Uh, so maybe I'm... Uh, Shut up, Andy. Uh, I, <laughs> I was going to say, I recognize myself in that. Uh, it's, uh, the, uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, so there'll be lots of footnotes that will say, well, this, 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 and then they'll even have, you know, say that my favorite is the... Uh, citing itself, citing itself, uh, you know, sort of embedded quotes, and kind of looking like a Supreme Court decision in that context, but not a Supreme Court decision, all internal to the executive branch. So it's a, it's a claim, right, rather than a, a fact. But, and this is sort of the, the last part of what we can think about it, I suspect we'll talk about more, is it's a, a claim that Congress has not pushed back on very hard frankly. And so, you know, whereas in the 1970s, Congress wanted to deal itself back in, in the post-Watergate uh, Vietnam era, uh, again, not only more powers in budgeting, in ethics, in, uh, executive agreements, all sorts of areas where Congress passed new framework statutes, we've seen very little of this. And indeed, even those statutes have been weakened by the Chapa decision in the early 1980s, which made a legislative veto unconstitutional. Uh, so even where you have had intermittent congressional pushback, for example, uh, efforts to uh, remove the U.S. from the proxy war in Yemen um, and to actually uh, pass a resolution after the Soleimani assassination that, uh, you know, effectively that going any further would require a further declaration of, uh, of war by Congress, uh, President Trump was able to veto those resolutions. Uh, and Congress did not muster a veto-proof majority in any of those cases. Another example would be the National Emergencies Act, actually, which has a similar structure, requiring uh, a declaration by the president to be overturned affirmatively. So there has been some uh, discussion in Congress about repealing AUMF, so Biden administration is fine with repealing the 2002 AUMF, largely because it doesn't rely on it for anything that's going on right now. More circumspect, as, as talked about, its willingness to explore uh, revising the 2001 AUMF, but uh, only under conditions uh, that would, it argues, would not undermine the United States' ability to uh, to battle terrorism and other threats to the country. So there are, uh, and, you know, and so the sort of congressional objections are. are to revisiting this question are partly perhaps in good faith in that, yes, you want to be flexible and being able to respond to threats to the country. Uh, some are perhaps less in good faith, the idea that uh, nobody likes to be blamed for anything. And this provides a kind of handy framework for everything being the president's fault and you can just sort of carp from the sidelines. Um, and a uh, third question, perhaps one of the polarization that we've already touched on, it's extremely difficult to muster well, a veto-proof majority, for example, to do anything. Uh, is it possible to muster a uh, legislative majority to uh, revise, for example, the War Powers Resolution? We do have an interesting coalition of Mike Lee and Bernie Sanders mm -hmm. in the Navy um, <laughs> who are uh, attempting to sort of shift the default outcome um, such that uh, extended use of force uh, would require an actual <coughs> affirmative congressional vote. So sort of flipping uh, the switch there. So that instead of something continuing until Congress stopped it, it would stop unless Congress continued it. Uh, there's also in that same proposed legislation uh, uh, use of the power of the purse to try to cut off funding for any reward that, or use of force that went beyond uh, 
relatively short timeline. Uh, so to give teeth effectively to the War Powers Resolution was the idea behind that resolution. Will that go anywhere? Well, um, I think Will is going to tell us it will not. So I'll stop there. Um, great. So I think what I'd like to do is maybe breathe a little life into the possibility that um, Congress is relevant for thinking about our uh, deliberations about when and whether we exercise military force abroad. And I want to do it in two steps. One is to characterize how Congress matters. Um, and then the second, to reflect upon the significance of um, both uh, rising levels of polarization between the two parties and the um, mistakes that have been made over the last 20 years in US foreign policy for whether or not that characterization of Congress is right. And the short answer is, I'm going to say, is it was, it, it, it was, it is right and it's even, it's likely to be even more right going forward. Um, that's, that's where I'm going to go with this. And, and so when we think about the relevance of Congress, the, the places that we start, usually, this is at the back of you, and you, you, did, you, you sort of dispensed with it, which I think is right, is to say, well, let's go revisit Article 1 and Article 2 and see whether or not you know, Congress is holding up to its obligations as, as the president abiding by its limited, um, you know, being faithful to the limited uh, powers that are, are granted to it. And we all say, no, 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 that's not much there. And then the next move is to say, well, let's think about um, these governing statutes in U.S. foreign policy, like the War Powers Act, um, or thinking about delegated authority in these authorizations, or to think about congressional responses to these OLC declarations of sort of unmitigated and broad, expansive powers. And, and what we see there is lots of reason for disappointment. I'll say, and we can, we can explore this, but forward, I think there is domestic political significance to casting votes the delegate authority that are meaningful and we can reflect upon that. They're not entirely benign, um, but, but that if you're looking for constraints, kind of robust constraints, you're not likely to find them there. So the question is, where do we find them? How do these politics work? And I, I guess what I'd like to suggest is the way to think about it is that when presidents contemplate um, exercising military force abroad, they recognize that there is uncertainty um, and in this environment, and that things can go awry, they can go horribly awry. Um, and there's a question about how Congress will respond in the face of forward policy blunders, or when people uh, unnecessarily die. And, and recognizing that risk that they face, um, they then need to think about, well, is Congress going to do the work? And, and you pointed to this earlier, Doug. That is Congress going to sort of respond by saying, well, what we need to do is rally behind our president and re uh, reassert our resolve to see this fight through to the end? Because what has been revealed to us uh, in these deaths is the abject um, uh, awfulness of the enemy that we need to kind of gather ourselves to defeat. Or is Congress going to say, the legislature is going to say, what is revealed to us is a president who's completely out of his depths. There's no idea what he's doing. Lack of planning. Both those responses are available to Congress. And legislators, um, not just when they show up on the news, but they can decide whether or not to launch hearings and investigations and decide how much money to appropriate and whether or not to start thinking about um, bills that would be introduced can do all kinds of things that are costly to a president um, or that stand behind a president. And just and precisely because public opinion is valuable in this space, I think that we broadly think is true, and how malleable there debates to be had, but it is malleable, how Congress responds is going to matter a whole bunch. And so the next step in this is to say that well, how Congress is going to respond is going to depend a whole lot on the partisan composition of Congress. And that what we can reliably anticipate is that um, when uh, the president looks over at Congress and sees all kinds of co-partisans um, running the show, they can expect a more favorable response in the aftermath of failure, and I'll put quotes around that, right? That things, when things go wrong, um, that they will, they aren't going to unleash the investigations and the hearings and make life difficult. Um, 
And I'll say, I think that's what's happening right now in the aftermath mm -hmm. of uh, this withdrawal from Afghanistan. And there's all reasons, all kinds of reasons to be critical of what's happened over the last few months, not in the policy itself, but in the execution of the policy. And what we hear is quiet from, uh, from, from Capitol Hill. And I would venture to say, uh, Biden, that's what Biden knew. Right? This is, he looks over and says, this is a tough call. Like pulling out, hmm, tough call. Uh, tough call, not in the sense that it is not the right policy decision, but there is, um, there's cost. There's, that's the, there's, there's, there's the most sort of political friction in the withdrawal. And the easy thing for him politically to have done was simply to pass off a troubled occupation as well as pass off to him. Um, so, okay. So they think about the partisan composition of Congress. Um, and this is, I mean, Dr. Dem got this at some length, that, that you see a lot of uh, evidence that suggests that presidents respond more quickly to foreign military uh, crises abroad, that, they, that the probability of response increases, the regularity with president, presidents uh, respond, that the duration of the response, all is correlated with the partisan composition of Congress. And this is the basic logic to it. It's about um, if things go awry, how will they respond? Will they make life difficult for me? So if that, and, and that's tied up in these partisan considerations. Um, and it's not written into governing statutes about authorizations or written into the first two articles of the Constitution. It's a, fact, it's a, it's a political calculation that, that, that presidents are making and that legislators are making. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, is, this, is this relationship likely to hold? Um, and I think, I think the answer is yes. This has been true of U.S. foreign policy for a good long time and it's likely to continue. Um, the easy case is the rising levels of polarization. To the extent that Democrats or Republicans are diverging, then the, the relevance of that partisan, those partisan considerations is likely to become even more acute. Um, so just as, um, uh, um, Dan, when you're pointing to the rising levels of polarization as making it more difficult to articulate and sustain a green strategy, so too, I would suggest, presidents are gonna be even more acutely aware of and thinking about the partisan composition of Congress when contemplating exercising military force abroad. There's this other piece too that we can take, and this is um, Walt's lament about US foreign policy over the last 25 years, what end the fallout of Afghanistan? What are we, what are the lessons that are we really likely to draw? One is we're gonna be less, it's gonna be, and the counsel that was presented here, which is we should be more hesitant to intervene abroad. Um, and then, and that's in part because of the lessons that we've learned about the failures of, you know, the lack of humility. But it also is a recognition that it's going to be harder to build coalitions um, in support of U U.S. military ventures abroad. To the extent that that's true, it's going to have two effects on presidential decision making. One's going to affect the intercept. The other one's going to affect that coefficient on the relationship between the partisan composition of Congress and the likelihood of the military deployment abroad. These two effects are one, we're less likely to exercise force abroad, one, two. But, but it's also going to sharpen the relevance of the partisan composition in the following kind of way. Presidents are gonna go out when they want to exercise military force abroad, they're gonna, they're more likely to have to own the decision themselves. They're gonna have to put it out there and say, this is the thing we have to do. And they're gonna, they don't get to find um, uh, comfort in talk about coalitions of the willing. It's that, no, no, it's not of the willing and broad consensus, it's my argument and my argument alone. And to the extent that that's true, then they're gonna be all the more vulnerable when things go awry to the kinds of criticisms that partisan opponents would make when they step in and they say, what are you doing in that country? And, and that that happened is again, evidence that you, that you, you are, are totally in over your head which again, to my mind, is then going to sharpen the relevance of these partisan considerations. It's not going to uh, undermine the significance of um, kind of broad partisan politics that inform interbranch deliberations in both domestic policy and foreign policy. It's going to make it sharper going forward. And so while, yes, foreign policy is an area of widespread tumult and change, um, I think this is a point of continuity going forward in thinking about the politics. No, I think it's better. Sorry, we just sort of follow the mold of the first one. We'll do all four presentations, and Sarah and I will agree. Okay.
Uh, so just a slight introduction, because I'm not of a university like you all are. Um, as a practitioner, I feel very seen right about now in that I worked on Central American policy you know, in the National Security Council in Mexico on the rule of law. And I was in Afghanistan twice between 2009 and 10, uh, and to part from the embassy of the sort of the strategy discussion about the surge of troops at that point, and then I went back as number two at the embassy between 2017 and 18. Um, so I won't recapitulate my paper so much. I think it's very elementary to talk to this group about DIME, the tools of national security, diplomatic, information, military, and economic. And um, what I want to really look at is the strategy issue or strategy slash policy issue, and then the implementation toolkit that these, uh, these four elements represent. Um, and the truism is that all of them have to be used together. Um, anything from the idea of whole of government or just the acronym itself, that's true, but um, what isn't always understood well enough is issues of usage, and in particular, uh, something like timing. So that um, I like to think of the National Security Council you know, meeting structure and conversation as almost uh, somebody who's preparing to you know, go into surgery, let's say, and you have to hand them something. And what is the tool you're going to hand them to achieve the effect that, that we all say that we want? Um, but these tools obviously travel on such radically different paths and take different amounts of time. And so the military tool, uh, just to go back to the same but different medical metaphor, let's say you have your sick patient. The military tool is like emergency surgery. You know, let's do something right away. And it's heroic. And it sometimes kills the patient. But it's also something big and you can do it fast. Uh, diplomacy is more like sitting down and getting a really long case history and talking to the patient's family and, you know, it's, it's probably a better option, but it's not dramatic and it's going to take a while and it's frustrating when you want to, you know, achieve something quickly. And uh, the information, the public diplomacy is more like a bunch of pamphlets on preventative medicine that the patient should have read, you know, before <laughs> long ago. <laughs> and the economic one, I, I was searching on that one, but it's kind of like the access to every single possible test you could have or the best specialist. Um, and uh, anyway, when you are in that uh, moment of trying to give a policymaker an answer, all the different agencies around the table are you know, going to give their best option. You know, they'll say, your problem, the solution to your problem looks suspiciously like the thing my agency does and, and give, it, give it to them. But um, they often get missold as something that will have an effect in, in a more immediate term. Um, when I was a diplomat, I started in 1989. And so I was sort of front row to this pre-9-11 decade of the liberal hegemony strategy. I appreciate hearing that phrase because I sort of implemented something I didn't know the strategic name for. And we would have told you it was the McDonald's theory of you know conflict, that, that countries with McDonald's didn't go to war with each other, which was Thomas Friedman in 1996, which I just looked up. And, but, but this is what we were told. And, and, uh, and so we, you know, we didn't implement a McDonald's theory, but we understood it that way. <laughs> And, um, and that was what we were all a part of. And the idea of the theory, it's, it's actually at the level that I was at, it's kind of a million small decisions. And so that was where we had military use during that time. It was more justified on humanitarian grounds. Um, we had a better multilateral diplomacy uh, approach, I think, on peacekeeping, but we, you know, we didn't necessarily strengthen that arm uh, as much as we could have. Um, and in the economic toolkit, I think it was the trade emphasis that we were going to knit the whole world together to be this you know, McDonald's group of people who didn't fight each other. And post 9-11, you know, all of the justifications, as I mentioned before, when you want the currency of the government, that's time of important people and money. Um, you have to know the buzzword, you have to know what to call everything. So overnight, in a way, everything that I had previously justified as advancing liberal democracy was now advancing counterterrorism. 
Um, and the biggest change, of course, that we all saw was where the military fit into this. And the idea of the fear and emotion, you know, the American public and its role in all of this, I felt it from inside the blog, the blog, excuse me, um, you know, in a way that we understood that certain things that had not been available to us were now available. And that the military and money were available in a way that hadn't uh, occurred before. I mean, things in the 90s were on the cheap and suddenly we had resources in the state, even in the State Department, it sort of trickled down even to us. Um, and that the idea of risk tolerance with respect to losing American lives overseas had also flipped sort of overnight from the Somalia or Haiti in 1994 with the, or 93, I guess, when the ship was turned around because there were armed thugs on the dock and, and the idea of Kosovo and you know, air power only. And, and now the um, you know, troops on the ground, people losing their lives and how the American public for a while you know, pretty much thought what, that was sad, but okay, because they felt less threatened at home. Um, and as a diplomat though, I felt like I was being seen as someone who was too slow to meet the demands of the moment. And very quickly, I'll just say in 2009, when President Obama was undergoing the, the strategy review about whether or not to surge troops to Afghanistan, uh, my ambassador, former military, and a couple other senior people at the embassy, and I was part of a drafting group, came up with a cable to Washington that said, the surge is a bad idea. This is a long-term engagement. The civilian structures are weak. They're not a uh, sufficient counterpart to us. Counterinsurgency isn't gonna work. And you know, keep the troop levels at a kind of, the number where they are for maintenance and keep going for a while. Um, and that had such an incredible blowback to my ambassador. I mean, he essentially lost his ability. Well, first of all, the cable was leaked. And so he lost his ability to work with the Afghan government pretty much, but he also lost his ability to be taken seriously by the military. So this is the same policy decision that I think President Biden has referenced where the military steamrolled uh, people who believe that the surge was a bad idea. Um, and the economic toolkit, I mean, it doubled down on trade and we started to see the, the um, post 9-11 for at least 10 years or so, trade agreements were always what we pushed. I was in El Salvador when we were in favor of CAFTA, the Central America Free Trade Agreement. Um, and it seemed like the answer you know, until, I guess, as of 2016, it really wasn't. Um, so where we end up is just that I feel like we've used the military so extensively to address the, you know, the preformed idea of what our threats were, you know, as counterterrorism threats that as, other, as others have mentioned, we're not in a good enough position to use other tools of national security um, to address these bigger issues, either is China, or transnational uh, crime, which I think sort of encapsulates some of what you mentioned about immigration, but it's even bigger than that because it's the security of our entire economic system, um, or the climate change and pandemic and other global issues that we face. You know, our toolkit, I think, isn't in the right position to do that. So finally, as, again, as a practitioner, <laughs> um, the strategies, you know, you just have to understand they get dumbed down quite a bit when it comes to the pointy end of the spear to the people who are making those daily decisions when talking to foreign officials, when trying to negotiate treaties. I mean, it is important that there are people at a senior level in the government thinking big thoughts and having grand designs, but there's a lot of policy making that happens on a daily basis on the ground. Um, and the other tools are still not well enough understood. Rule of law programs really do take generations. Public diplomacy and exchanges also take generations. They are seeds that you're glad later on that you planted. Um, but nobody seems to have the courage to either tell the policymaker that at the time they ask for a solution or to tell the American public that. 
Um, so until we get a little more honest uh, about how these tools are used, I worry that we're going to continue to be unprepared uh, to face the challenges. So <clears throat> thank you very much. I just want to interject here, maybe bring in the courts a little bit to the discussion we have about um, separation of powers and foreign affairs. And I, I, I try to sketch out something in the paper, but I wanted to maybe give it more than once in the presentation here about what I think the risk of judicial intervention are. And I think they're higher uh, today than they've usually been. Some of it may have to do with domestic policy, but there is an aspect involving the Solicitor General's office that has made this really uh, worrisome. And I, I'll explain why and why. So generally, and I'm going to use maybe in, in the addition to talking to the folks who did the um, sort of the grand strategy vision, like maybe thinking a little bit about the Mexico City policy and use it as an example. When you have policy flip flops over time, why is that at risk of judicial intervention? And I could use the, the Mexico City thing as an illustration because of the following the, the vulnerabilities work this way, and that's a policy flip flop. But then there's what they call an institutional position flip-flop, which I think is actually much more dangerous, where presidents make um, inconsistent claims about their constitutional authority from one administration to the other. Courts do not like that because it immediately suggests that something fishy is going on. So one thing I was going to say with respect to the Mexican policy thing, here's what's interesting about it from the possession of risk of judicial intervention is all the affected individuals in that policy are largely going to be foreign uh, NGOs or institutional actors who support uh, uh, health services for women or something like that. Now, these are foreigners, but imagine what's happening to them. They may receive some aid from the Norwegian government, they may receive some aid from the Netherlands, then they receive aid from the United States. And they kind of have gotten that the United States is going to have inconsistent requirements across electoral cycles. So if you're strategic in that kind of institution, you kind of have a pocket where American funds go, and it has nothing to do with reproductive services because you can't rely on it. You can't plan ahead, not knowing what the next American election is going to be, right, or something like that. Now, let's assume that that were an American recipient. One thing they would be able to claim is that the inconsistencies in these policies are affecting their bottom line financially. Once you have a financial claim, usually that gives you standing because you're not in the same position as others. And then you could say the administration is flipping back and forth on this and you suggest that it's not done for reasoned, uh, like there are no good policy reasons behind it. And once a court gets wind of that, they feel more comfortable of interjecting and say, this looks arbitrary and capricious. I don't think that there's anything that happened between Biden and the previous administration other than that there was a partisan turnover. And great, change your partisan, change your policies, but when you're affecting millions of dollars worth of things for ordinary citizens, we're going to hold you to task. And we're going to say, explain why you're doing this. And if you can't explain it, we're going to say, arbitrary, capricious, you can't do it, or something like that. And so this is how this plays out in real life. You try to find somebody who's affected. You try to find somebody who's affected in a financial way, not emotional, not psychological. And you try to say, look, they relied on this policy. They were intended to rely on this policy. If you switch it without explanation, we can find no other reason that you did it other than the fact that it was a partisan turnover. So that exposes the level, the risk of judicial intervention. Courts feel more comfortable intervening, but not. Now, in foreign policy, it used to be the case that even if you have those policy swings, when it comes to the institutional authority of the president, there was consistency across administrations. People will say, We're, we need more flexibility or we don't need more flexibility. What you're noticing in the most graphic illustration of this is like saying the alien tort statute situation. Where the alien tort statute, where, the law, where you're allowed to sue a foreigner for a tort that is committed abroad, right? And this foreigner, it's a foreigner suing another foreigner for a tort committed abroad in violation of the law of nations. So the question is, can you bring it in American? The typical way this has worked in is that democratic administrations would say, courts, you should have jurisdiction over this. You should, people should complain to bring the claim. 
A Republican administration comes in, its Solicitor General goes before the court and says, this is interfering with foreign policy. Court should get away from it. This will interfere with the presidential prerogative in foreign policy if we allow people to bring torts against foreign government officials for torts that are committed abroad. Then a, a Democratic administration Solicitor General comes in and says, that's a no-no. I mean, even the Solicitor Generals themselves are really icky about this because now they've lost the trust with the Supreme Court. They are claiming inconsistent beliefs about or preferences about constitutional authority. One says it interferes with the president's constitutional authority. The other says, well, courts can do this. It doesn't affect us all. In fact, our foreign allies like it. The, the point is that South Africans want you to do this. And then the next administration will come in and say, it, it's it, do you understand what I'm saying? That in itself, once you start to lose the trust, and then you lose it in another area, you know, you can look at the permitting of the Keystone Pipeline, same thing. What is it that the Obama administration discovered about environmental policy that the Trump administration didn't seem to understand? That the previous, why is an executive agency making grand claims about the risk of environmental factors that seems to switch the first day they come into power, by the way, because that's what happened with the Keystone Pipeline. A permit is given, and the Keystone, the Canadian company, had already spent millions of dollars. Why? Because they were meant to rely on that permit. The permit is supposed to give them the authority to continue to construction. Then the next administration comes in and says they're revoking the permit. Anyway, these kinds of things where somebody's losing money based upon your inconsistency, it's not a broad, right? It's a discrete individual. What <laughs> happened? Generate court decisions that have doctrine explicitly saying that the president cannot do it. Once that doctrine is out there, it's like a loaded gun. It could be used in other circumstances. And the illustration I bring up to this is that when you look at a case called Campbell versus Clinton, which is Campbell is the Thomas Campbell, the Republican serving the Palo Alto uh, uh, region. This is in Kosovo. He claims that the Kosovo intervention is a leap from the perspective that it wasn't authorized. He goes up to the DC circuit. One thing that is interesting is that Campbell and all the legislators who bring this claim against Clinton are relying on business decisions. They're relying on doctrine formed from private parties who have brought private claims, including insurance claims about war. And they're saying there are all these decisions here where courts have made a determination that there are hostilities and these are qualifications for the hostilities. Why can't you use it here when we're suing the president and provide us not damages, but declaratory and injunctive relief? That is an order to the president to stop the Kosovo intervention. And the question is, at least one judge thought, yes. If I can show, if you can show me you have standing, and here's what you need to show me, I am willing to write a decision. This is a president, this is a judge appointed by Clinton himself. So what I'm trying to say is that you have this irony that cases that were forged in insurance and private party claims for financial damages develop doctrine that can be mined for declaratory injunctive claims against the president by a member of Congress. And I think you're going to see more and more of these cases down the pipe. Uh, and one last thing I was going to say with respect to uh, what's going on in Afghanistan. With all the private contractors who've been involved in this, there's an understanding that the claims are going to be enormous. And the Defense Department is going to have to settle a lot of people. I think the Defense Department wisely has kind of signaled, just bring in the fact that you have a contract. We'll pay costs. You own, we will do this, what they call a declaration of government convenience. That which is, we are going to announce we're breaching. We're breaching the contracts, so we don't have to dispute whether we breached. Come in, we'll give you um, the cost plus some profit, right? So that's fine. But here's what they did that I think is going to get them into some trouble: is that when these contractors who are the contractors of the Defense Department announced this, they said, we also have subcontractors that we subcontracted with. Who's going to settle those people? And it seems that the Defense Department has hinted that it's going to settle them and the subcontractors. And this is what we said a little about this yesterday. The wrinkle with that is that that's going to probably increase the risk of fraud. 
That is, there are going to be some Afghan third parties who are going to say, wow, you tell me if I produce a contract, the government will pay me cost plus some additional profit, and I'm here in Afghanistan, and I was supposed to supply tires. Let's assume that the government decides, the person in, the, in, in finance in the best department says, I'm going to challenge 15 of these and suggest that they're fraudulent. What happens is that in the Court of Federal Claims, there will be litigation over the scope of these claims. And I bet you there will be, if that happens, there will be introduced into evidence claims that these generals probably reassured a lot of these people that no matter what happens, this gig is going to go on for a long time. And if that gets introduced into evidence, it's going to be bad doctrinal. You don't want, you don't want these kinds of ex party reassurances that maybe these generals made to these people. Ah, no, even if we pull out next year, you are going to be fine. You're going to complete the bridge. You're going to complete the hospital. And we're going to continue paying you. Don't worry about it. They can get around that problem by telling everybody we're breaching and we'll pay you money. But what if those people they suspect of fraud? They may litigate those claims. And if they litigate those claims, I just, I believe the Defense Department finance person who would do it just says, I don't want us to be defrauded. But what they're going to be doing is creating doctrine that can come back and buy the defense department later on down. Anyway, anyway, you get the problem is that I just think that there are these ways that are just unintended that involve low states private claims about damages that can lead to federal doctrines and judicial doctrines that are used as a weapon down the line. And so I'll leave it at that. Thanks so much, Ida. Thanks to all four of you for really interesting papers. Um, Sarah and I will try and be brief so that we have plenty of time for the full panel discussion. Uh, Andy, I've got three questions for you. Um, so the first one is, how influential are these blank checks of the two post 9-11 AUM maps? Uh, how much power are they really given presidents? To be sure, presidents have interpreted these documents in ways that are far beyond the intent of the legislators who drafted them. And in some cases, they are explicitly in contrast to the language itself. But as your paper notes, presidents, when they haven't gotten everything they wanted, they walk down the hall, they go to the OLC, and OLC has articulated legal arguments that give them unchecked power anyway, sometimes even arguing that there's absolutely nothing Congress could do to check them, even if they wanted to do so and exercise that power. So what do you, how do you see the value, the, the value of AU on that? Is it primarily legal? Uh, is it political? Does it provide political cover that mitigates subsequent criticism or pay some sort of additional dividends? Just how should we be thinking about this um, in, a, in a political sense? Uh, second, which is the greatest threat to some of the reform efforts that we've seen and, and where Congress com repeatedly fails? Uh, is it, i throw out a couple real fast, is it sort of the old Goldowski argument that most members look at foreign policy and just simply say, this isn't my job? That's not what I'm here for, and so it's a, a simple matter of, of uh, incentives that way. Is it partisan incentives, trumping institutional ones? Um, are Democrats who are so eager to rein in power under Trump gonna, gonna waffle on this now? Uh, I think there's a lot of concern about that uh, on Schiff's team, about even sort of non foreign policy reforms, we're gonna be able to continue to keep our people online when we have them all. Uh, and then finally, uh, is it just some sort of Mayhewian electoral calculus? Better to be reactive than proactive in foreign affairs. It's a whole lot better to snipe than it is to try and get out in front. So I'm just curious what your take on this was, having looked at the AUM app so much and the efforts on them. Uh, and then finally, a question that's sort of also uh, sort of in Gita's wheelhouse too, but then you might not want to speculate. Say that uh, Lee Murphy Sanders succeed. Uh, how would the ensuing constitutional battle royale play out, do you think, if we have a WPR that has teeth that wasn't watered down to, over, uh, to survive a Nixon Ford veto. You get around the Chada problem. Um, and we are back into the world where presidents report consistent with, rather than in compliance with the WPR. Would courts get in, would courts ever get involved this way? Chada's given them a real out. Uh, you know, will we just see more judicialization? So uh, I have no idea, and I'd just be fascinated to hear the panel's perspective on that. Uh, will, I have two thoughts for you. Um, the first one actually is something that I said to Sarah in the car when we were driving. I said this is going to be maybe my first political science conference ever in which we didn't hear the words causal identification uh, or uh, complain about model operationalization. 
and now I find myself that I'm going to make yeah, you're a comment about <laughs> No, so it reminds me of a comment that Terry Moe made uh, when I presented part of my dissertation a long time ago. And he's like, you got three measures of congressional stuff. Which one's the right one? It's like, well, theoretically, which one matters for your story? Um, and I think that we've both been guilty of this, sort of, you know, I'll show you that it works across all of them. Um, but in this response paper in particular, uh, I think there's more emphasis than I've ever seen in any of your writings on these topics on control. Um, you, you kept saying partisan composition in Congress today, but in the paper a lot, it's like unified government versus divided government. The control mm -hmm. of the machinery of the House and the Senate really matters. Um, and I wondered if you just might say a little bit more about that. I think we, we wave our hands sometimes and we say, oh, Congress can do these things. Having the committee gavel really matters. Um, but do you, you know, do you really think now that control is what really is important, that it doesn't matter that it's only 50 senators, there's Kamala Harris, and that fundamentally changes the nature of the game. Of course, it's better to have 60 senators than 50, but for Biden, all that really matters is that it's going to be a Democrat holding the gavel or what have you. Like, how do you see uh, that versus, you know, just critical mass issue. The more opposite, the more members of the opposition party there is, the more people there are to go on the Sunday talk shows and uh, the more prospect there is for mayhem. So just that question about control. Um, and then my second thought was just sort of thinking a little bit about polarization and unified government uh, and what that means, uh, but also thinking about uh, the contemporary political climate. So with, with all this written in polarization, um, at least in the American literature, I don't see us talking about it in foreign policy much at all. So this has been really refreshing for me. I think my last in-person conference was a conference on polarization. Uh, it wasn't recorded, so no one can fact check me, but I don't think the words foreign policy were ever uttered in an eight hour day. Uh, so cool to think about it in these ways. Um, and so the question that I had, Will, is about sort of, you know, to what extent does unified government empower and embolden presidents today? Um, I totally agree that unified government makes this a whole lot easier for Biden uh, to do what he did, uh, to finally be a president at the end of the war and did what he said he was going to do, as opposed to keeping the bare minimum in here, minimizing the political visibility of the war as much as possible, and then just handing it off and riding off into the sunset. That would have been easy, and, and unified government probably helped him do that. But this unified government in this current political climate, piggybacking on Steve a little bit here, public opinion, does it open the door for bold, aggressive uh, military actions and sort of more robust use of the use of force and instrument of foreign policy uh, mm -hmm. in this political climate in the same way that it did even 10 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, 30 years ago? Or do you see, yeah, unified government is still better than divided government, but there is something about public opinion independent of the positions of political elites and the ability of elites to sort of uh, ratchet it up that uh, is, is constrained. Uh, even in, in when the sort of the political stars all align. So thanks very much. I really enjoyed the book papers. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, everyone. Um, so I'll start with Annie. Uh, I really appreciated the practitioner perspective because we're all engaging with policy relevant questions, but I think you've been the closest to the actual policies among us. I think that's fair to say. I'm coordinating this. But like, no, but in recent years, so, I mean, it sounds like you were in 2017 and 18 um, in, in, uh, in Afghanistan. So um, thank you for that. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Um, one that engages with one of the comments that came up last night by, with Jim noting the increase in the defense budget above what Biden, Biden had requested. And your emphasis on the toolkit um, and I think where it seems like you conclude is that we need to be thinking about all of these aspects, kind of like um, Dan's question last night, do we need to reevaluate the toolkit? How do we use these? But I'm curious, I mean, if we're increasing the defense budgets, uh, I mean, how, I, mean, I think we're probably all on board with this, but I, I guess I'm curious to make sense of, um, doesn't that just kind of really emphasize the M of the dime so that every, so we're kind of carrying around a hammer and everything is going to look like a nail. So by kind of elevating the M, doesn't that, relatively speaking, um, make the D and the I and the E more diminutive? And how can we kind of balance these out? Um, 
The second question has to do with something that's looking forward a little bit. I just wanted to get your sense of this, um, of the upcoming democracy summit that Biden is hosting in um, December. And so where does that fit into this? Where does that fit into some of these questions about grand strategy that we've been talking about? Um, and I do want to keep these comments short so we have time for discussion. Uh, Gide, I really appreciate you bringing in the courts um, because when we teach separation of powers, the courts often get, even in a law school class, short shrift because they're kind of dismissed as, in the national security context, well, they sort of give deference to the executive because they, you know, indicate they don't really know enough about um, national security to be weighing in on this. Um, but I wondered, as I was thinking about your paper, and in, again, in the law school, um, taking a normative position doesn't seem to be as taboo as it is in political science. But I really wanted to understand kind of where you were on this normatively. And when you started your comments just now, I thought you were going to be taking more of a stand. I gather you think that this is risky for there to be kind of heavy handed judicial intervention. And if that's the case, though, I wondered about kind of the devil's advocate position. So Dan talks about these wild gyrations and will the policy flip flops. Um, isn't this sort of a guardrail for those gyrations? So if, and I was thinking, we kept talking about um, the Mexico policy, but I was thinking about the Supreme Court's recent ruling on remain in Mexico. And taking the sort of the, the position, setting aside whether that policy makes sense, um, isn't that a way to have more continuity in foreign policy so that you're not getting this, these wild gyrations and the judicial branches kind of create in a bit more continuity, at least bumpers, to make our commitments more credible? So I wonder if you could just comment a little bit more on kind of why is that not kind of from a separation of powers perspective, actually desirable to have the judicial branch stepping in. If maybe Congress is doing its job, but maybe it's not. So isn't that just sort of what the process should look like? Thanks. So maybe we could just ask uh, everyone to respond that would like. Um, maybe we can push this. I know everyone has a hard stop at 1245. We'll go 1240, and Sarah and I will promise to wrap up in three or four minutes. So it will be on time, but I really want to have some time. All right, well, you gave me uh, plenty to talk about, so I'll try not to say it all. Um, how influential are blank checks? Um, I don't think they can be infinitely extended. Let's start there. I mean, I don't think that you could use these to do anything you wanted as president of the world, uh, folding it into the uh, language of, say, the 2001 AUMF. You know, could you attack in the South China Sea? No, I don't think so, right? You didn't. So they're, they're limited in a sense, even if they're not uh, geographically limited, or even as it turns out, temporally limited. Uh, they are, I think, at least conceptually limited to the war on terror. Uh, now, granted, that is an expandable concept, but I think everybody still, I think, has sort of an idea of what that means and what it wouldn't mean. And so uh, I think there is some limit there. Uh, I do think they're important as political cover on the whole. Presidents, and I'll sort of circle back to this point, but presidents have, of course, for the most part, claimed that the War Powers Resolution was unconstitutional, that they did not need congressional approval, uh, for example, even in the first Gulf War in 1991, right, to kick some old goat out of Kuwait or whatever uh, George mm -hmm. H.W. said. Uh, he didn't need congressional approval. George W. Bush, I believe, you know, there was some argument about whether he needed to go to Congress in 2002. Uh, and that decision was partly driven by the UN and what was going on, with keeping Tony Blair on board. And we kind of speak more to that event then um, in terms of the internal deliberations. But there were clearly political considerations where it was thought to be a better thing to get congressional approval, even if you were going to claim you didn't need it. By the way, something Harry Truman did not do in Korea, uh, even though he was offered up a congressional resolution and support, he turned it down uh, on the advice of Dean Acheson, um, who said, you know, if you ask for it, it will look like you need it. Uh, so, you need it. Um, so um, it's Beijing Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So there is a, uh, I, I think there are political considerations for presidents, especially as they continue to prosecute the broader war on terror. They're also important, I think, especially, um, maybe not for all presidents, but there is this shift between the, the Bush and Obama administrations in terms of the justifications they use for their policies. 
right? Uh, George W. Bush did not have much of an issue with claiming a sort of prerogative power. You know, the war has activated all of these things that really require no statute. And in fact, of course, when it came to some policies, the claim was that even if Congress were to pass a law banning a particular action, that it could not be enforced because it would override the president's constitutional authority. And of course, um, interrogation policy was an aspect of that. Um, president Obama comes in and he doesn't want to make those same claims. He's a different kind of president. Um, and he wants to have all of his actions, uh, you know, either, you know, specifically or at least implicitly uh, drawn from the constitution, he says, or from statute. And so uh, this, it's very useful to have a statute that lets you do everything you want as if you had the power. And then he um, so I think there are, you know, um, for a president, I don't I not, wouldn't have to be a democratic president, for a president who wants to claim that Congress has said he can do whatever he wants to do, sort of the old William Howard Taft argument, right, versus Teddy Roosevelt, this is a, uh, you know, a, a useful thing to have. So they are influential in that sense. Uh, second point about uh, threat to reform issues. You gave three uh, things. So this is sort of the, it's not our job. Uh, partisan polarization, uh, make you slash electoral considerations. I'm going to add um, actual divisions on policy. These are hard questions. Uh, and that ties into sort of a fifth, which is the standard collective action problems that Congress always has. So um, of those, I mean, I think the Waldowski argument, right, about the two presidencies, um, I don't think that his actual argument still holds. You know, if you go back to that paper in 64, 64, it's older than this. It's older than All right, in the 60s, right? I, where he talks about how, you know, there's no interest groups in foreign policy. And Congress is deferential in foreign policy. And yeah, um, you know, John Dearborn's, uh, you know, upcoming book is a nice case study of people, of, of Congress actually looking at the executive and saying, yes, you are the right person to do this job. So there is a certain possible principled, uh, you know, uh, claim there for, you know, where the locus of decision making should be. There's also, you know, the Federal 70 argument about unity and dispatch and activity and secrecy, right? All the structural advantages of the president are real in this area. Um, but uh, I think I would have to come down to, you know, some combination of uh, Mayhew, not so much credit claiming, but blame shifting, blame avoidance, I would say, flip side of credit claiming. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think the partisan issues are real. The issue that, you know, my president doing something, doing X is strong leadership, but your president doing X is tyrannical. Uh, you know, I haven't noticed, uh, I didn't notice in the Trump administration, Ted Cruz writing a Wall Street Journal op-ed about the imperial presidency or a big, you know, the, you know, Eric Cantor put out a, uh, a volume, uh, you know, of, of things Obama had supposedly done that were imperial black cover, you know, dire warnings, you can do music with it. That yeah, didn't happen in the Trump administration. And again, Democrats unlikely to go that way in, in the Biden administration. Um, I would say though the biggest issue uh, is that voters don't care. They don't vote on this. They don't vote on separation of powers issues, as far as I can tell. Um, and so, why should Congress care about that? Um, in a certain way, so maybe that's made you ratchet it up to another more cynical level. But um, this is an issue that you know. How do you solve all this? How do you make Congress care? Well, I'm not sure they're going to care unless they do see electoral benefit in caring. Um, and again, the partisan uh, polarization, geographic sorting, if nothing else, makes that very difficult for you know a safe seat in Congress to, to care. Um, then, lastly, the question about the, uh, the constitutional battle royale. I'll just note um, again that presidents, except for Obama, have said that the War Powers Resolution was unconstitutional. Nixon's veto message back in 1973 has sort of been the template for that. Uh, I think where the National Security Act, as they're calling it. Um, is trying to get around that is by invoking the power of the purse, which even the strongest partisans of the unitary executive have to admit is a congressional power. And so uh, the legal side, I'm very curious to see what she may say, um, would be, I think, on the uh, question of, you know, yeah, can you restrict the president's ability to use force if indeed that is embedded somehow in Article 2, as presidents have been claiming. Uh, but I think it would be harder to overturn 
uh, the aspects linked to appropriations. Now, of course, presidents have long, you know, sort of gambled that Congress will not dare to shut off appropriations for a given uh, engagement to serving the troops. Right? Um, but you know, if it's automated, the members of Congress will go braver about that in the future. So um, there is a little bit of a hand tying operation here. You know, not that dissimilar from uh, you know, fast track trade or base closing. You know, it might be a a way of Congress protecting itself from its own failings uh, in regards to coming back to that decision-making process. So anyway, I think there's more to talk about in that area, but uh, I'll leave it there for now. Um, so while the public may be generally disengaged in matters involving foreign policy, and while they may not be demanding that legislators uh, uphold their constitutional obligations to run foreign policy or um, there are real political gains to be had when you're the opposition party of shining a bright light on the failures of a president who's blundered. Um, and and so you raise this issue about you know Blair wanting to see Congress um, authorize uh, um, military force in Iraq. Why would he, why would he want that? Um, why he would want that is not because he cares per se about a balance of powers or that Congress won't build. It's that he wants legislators to put down their support because that's going to have implications for their ability downstream to say, this was a really bad idea. How dare you draw, drag us into war? It mutes the ability of an opposition party. It doesn't eliminate, but it mutes somewhat their ability to raise questions about an original decision. Um, and so that's so that he finds some assurance in that as a way to then to then proceed. What can legislators do when they scream and holler in the aftermath of um, uh, foreign policy blunders? They can show up on TV, and that has implications for the content of public opinion. They can launch hearings and investigations. They can pass laws. This has implications for your question, which is how are we to think about the functional form or the relationship between the conflict? partisan composition of Congress and President's decision making. If it's just about showing up on TV, then every warm body counts, right? If it's about launching hearings and investigations, well then that shift from 49 to 51 or 50 plus the vice president, that's where the action is because that's the spigot that you can turn on once you have control. If it's about passing laws, that's the thing that will be set into motion in the aftermath of some observed failure, um, then, uh, then it's about going from 59 to 60. And so I think we're unclear about like, which of those things matters most um, because we don't know. We don't know. But we think all of that stuff does matter. And that some, and that, that should, I think what, we, what we're observing now with regards to congressional silence in the aftermath of the Af uh, uh, Afghanistan withdrawal is a testament to the value of control. Um, that that's really that's an essential part. But that's not the entirety of the story. Um, the, the, the question, too, about, um, you know, will presidents now be especially emboldened during periods of unified government, that is testimony not just to the significance of polarization, but the unity within parties. You can have high levels of polarization, but a whole lot of variation. But if everybody's walking in lockstep, um, and you're the president, and you look out, and you say, I've got control, and... Everybody is, you know, on a point, which is the point where I'm at. Then I think, at the margin, the answer is, yeah, you sh you will be more bold and exercise the force abroad. Um, now there are these countervailing theory, the, the, the considerations. So I don't think that uh, I wouldn't expect now that Biden, in this period of re reasonable unity uh, relative to the past more unity within the Democratic Party, and the fact that he has unified government to go out and launch all these military ventures abroad, quite the opposite. But for reasons, for reasons that are outside of the story of congressional constraints um, um, on, on presidential war powers. But we should be, when we think about it, it's both those things. It's sort of polarization and it's unity within parties as, as mattering a, a bunch. And the last thing I'll, I'll say is by way of concession, and that sort of underlines the remarks I've offered, is that a president who exercises force abroad and who succeeds uh, is going to get away with it regardless of the partisan competition Congress. If you do it and you pull it off and you stick that landing, you're good. Um, 
Um, and I don't see much in terms of offering a meaningful constraint within Congress or within the courts if they do it. But what, what's behind it is you don't necessarily stipulate. Um, and, and, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and so and so then the question is what is the political fallout of those um, those failures? Um, and there's a parts of valence to it. Um, so I actually just want to start, I hope we push back a tiny bit on the issue of the congressional reaction to the Afghanistan pullout. You just, maybe this is too thin, but there are hearings that are coming up next week, um, and uh, Secretary Brinkman has got the House and Senate Foreign Affairs Committees ahead of him, and I'm aware, because I'm actually quite involved with some of this, of, you know, dozens of pages of, of questions that are being submitted by groups that include um, uh, veterans groups and the NGO community. That you know, who cares about the NGO community? But they have some constituencies. And what I was going to say is sort of to shift it a little bit is that within parties, even if it's the president party, I mean, um, Senator Menendez. As chair is really exercised about this, and so it's the sub constituencies that can kind of trump, or I need another word, can yeah. be more, <laughs> they can be more weighty than the loyalty of the president. And so, if you have roused that particular group, maybe the, the loyalty of the president's party is going to be uh, shaken. Um, so uh, in response to the question about the defense budget, right, always the case, and they're the, the giant uh, you know, budgetary gorilla who gets everything. I can argue two sides, right? One, it doesn't matter because, of course, they get more money because what they do costs more money. And so if you want to keep the State Department, if you wanted to double its size so that it could do twice of, as much of what it does, it wouldn't cost as much as, you know, insert military hardware here. <laughs> so that's fair that they get so much money. Um, and uh, and it doesn't have to mean that we are all diminished by it um, because the other currency out there is time and attention. And so if the president is seen at international, uh, you know, in international conversation with other countries, pursuing diplomatic uh, means, then that's a currency as well as money that's in play. Or it really matters because it's this sucking noise of congressional funding and attention. And, um, and also, and this is, I don't mean to impute these motives, but there occasionally is this desire to sort of use what you have. So if you, you know, first of all, you go to the money, second of all, you made this thing, and then third of all, there it is, why not? use it. And so I think there have been certain activities that were a little bit driven by that, you know, kind of negative dynamic that if we pay for it and we have it, you know, we need to use it on something. Um, but we do know that the services that see certain, they, they see themselves as being able to carry out certain activities, they're going to emphasize that threat. So there was always this inter-service rivalry that the Navy thought China was a bigger threat than the Marine Corps did, because the Navy gets more stuff if China's the bigger threat. Um, and then on the Democracy Summit, I, I would say the word that came to mind was silliness or an extension of the McDonald's theory um, that I really, really don't uh, think this is a good, you know, this isn't a good look for us right about now. And um, it reminds me of what you've all probably forgotten that in the 90s there was the community of democracies idea. Yeah. Um, the same idea. This is, uh, this is where we should under-promise and over-perform. We have to stop having conversations about what we are and just start being what we are. And that we would do this on the heels of having taken what was a not perfect but still democracy in Afghanistan and literally handed it to a theocracy and, and sort of on the heels of that, talk about our democracy promotion is worse than a joke. And I think also, you know, we make bargains with countries all over the world that are democracies in name only. Um, again, I don't think this is the kind of thing we should go public with. Um, thank you. I was going to say I um, I did express some normative skepticism about the role of judicial intervention, and to be honest, uh, and I, I mean this sincerely, uh, look at my colleagues who have spoken earlier today. 
A lot of them, Corey spoke about some need to reorient policy, right? Uh, Dan spoke about sometimes abandoning some aspects of the grant strategy thing about offshore balancing and moving in a certain direction. Steve talked about reorienting things about where we're really good and kind of maybe moving away from things where where our kind of knowledge and ability to influence things. All of these things may influence policy change. And policy change can happen under various administrations for nothing that had to do with what I would call a partisan flip-flop model. The problem is that courts don't have the ability to distinguish these things. And if there are too many partisan flip-flops and they're creating doctrine and partisan flip-flops, when there's a policy change, you're gonna get people also challenging policy change. And to have people, to have courts going like, do I really buy into your theory of grand strategy? Or it's just a bad idea. And so maybe preserving that policy space so that people, the presidents, or you know, when they really need to change, know that they can do without having to think about courts in the background. And so in, what I'm trying to say is that even in institutional self-preservation, if I'm Biden, I will be very sensitive about engaging in too many institutional flip-flops. Because if it does, I am inviting the courts to say, look, this is the seventh time you've overruled something that Trump did. And I just think that this is really a partisan game and we're coming in. Because if he then wants, or if they then want to operate in what I would call a really policy change mode, they're also inviting the courts to scrutinize. So that's the, that's the one thing that worries me. The second is a little bit nuanced and it has to do with the role of private actors and standing. To the extent, as we see in Afghanistan, that the United States is often relying as part of whatever strategy is and a lot of private actors, right? There's a higher likelihood that those people can go into courtrooms, right? Think about it this way. If an American soldier dies in Iraq or gets run over by a truck, they really don't have any real relief in the courts. The courts are not gonna give them standing. If a private contractor is contracted to do the work that that soldier does and gets run over or hit by something, they may have access to courts. If people believe that the more they private, government actors believe that the more they private contract out, the more courts are likely going to be screening, then that's going to affect their willingness to engage in private contracts. And all I'm just trying to say, that determination will be made not on any kind of good policy ground but on just the basis that you don't want courts to be involved in your lives. And I don't think that that's a good thing. If we're going to dispatch with private contractors, let's do it on good policy grounds, not because people are afraid of open up a flood of, but it, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so maybe that's my hesitation. And I don't know whether it's good enough, but that would be where I'm coming from. So. I think at this point we could just open up the floor, so uh, excuse me. So I have a question in three quick parts. The question is, it seems like a lot of the AUNF discomfort is the expansion um, in cases where um, the threat is migrating or is a small scale use of force. Don't we have earlier precedents? What's, what's the Barbary pirates <laughs> rationale? And aren't those contemporarily constrained? Would be my question. And then my three quick points. First, um, Annie, I would argue that bureaucracies don't always argue that they're the tool that should be used. In fact, in my experience, it is most often the case that the Pentagon argues, no, no, not us, right? The Rwanda genocide, uh, Colin Powell's hesitance to go into the Balkans. It's the Secretary of State saying, you've got it, I'd like to use it. Won't you loan it to me for a while? Um, I love, Oh, um, second point, insurance driving. Uh, the, you see that starting to happen in cyber. What is gonna drive federal protections on cyber policy is people are gonna start to get sued for not doing enough to protect private information or security. It, uh, I think that's exactly right. My third point is I love your medical metaphor. <laughs> I thought it was wonderful. And I was trying to think about what's the parallel in the McDonald's realm. And maybe it's, uh, we no longer have, the, the McDonald's theory has been disproven, but what about the In-N-Out Burgers theory, which is we're only, we're gonna be so special, we're only gonna operate in, in a space that brands us. That's the democracy promotion. 
app, we're only going to do it where it's successful. Or the Chick-fil-A model, <laughs> which is um, everybody loves our product, but people will boycott it because of our behavior on other things. And maybe that's the Saudi Arabia and the Yemen war. Um, so maybe we need a modernization of that. I'm, I'm not sure, quite sure why, but I think I want a, a blanket moratorium on fast food metaphors. <laughs> I'm not quite sure why. I, I have two, two questions. One is, um, what possible incentive, given the current structure of American politics, the way elections work, et cetera, does a congressman or a senator have for doing really serious hearings on a foreign policy issue? I don't mean Benghazi style hearings. I mean something like the Fulbright hearings on Vietnam or Truman's hearings on government procurement in World War II. All right, if I'm an individual congressman, I don't think I have much to gain by leading that kind of really tough-minded investigation and I have lots to lose. So just it does, is there a way that an individual congressman has? And second, um, there was this real puzzle when Biden said, actually, shortly after becoming president, that he wanted a revision in the AOMF. Right, he wanted to get rid of the one, he wanted everybody to write a new one. And I thought, that, well, that was paradoxical, right? This is a president saying, I want to give up some power, right? Now I've got this blanket thing I can use for lots of different purposes. I don't want that anymore. And this most, I think, for well, but I thought of him sort of three reasons. He might just agree that, that it's not good to expand these things infinitely, just on policy grounds. He agrees with that. Second, he wants Congress to have to take some ownership here. But perhaps most important, it also gives him a way to say no. When there's out, an outrage someplace and he's getting public or congressional pressure to do something, mm -hmm. he can say, I can't do it. I don't have an authorization. Mm -hmm. If Congress wants to authorize me to do this, have them grow a spine, have them put this in front of me, and then I'll do it. But he, he has sort of an excuse not to act. Mm -hmm. The one problem with the infinitely elastic AOMF we had it was pretty hard for a president to say, oh, okay, I got nothing I could do about the situation in filling the blank. All right, so I'd just be curious, you know, if that's what's going on. President tying his own hands to liberty. No. Yes to the first two. I don't think that's available to presidents. I don't think there's a world in which presidents get to say, I would do that, but for. It's, it's just Obama not did. available to them. Obama, part of what Obama did when he didn't do the red line was to say there's no congressional support but this for is, it. Right? And, and, and it doesn't work, actually. How that work out for him? How that work out for him, like, politically? One. Right. And two, I think there's an effort there. I think that particular move was an effort to try to get, there's a reason why presidents want to get legislators to sign off on things, right? That There's a political calculus there. But, but the world in which pre the modern president can say, I don't have the authority to, not just in foreign policy, in anything. I mean, what political valor is for presidents is overcoming whatever obstacles he might put before them. Right. Obama and, did get reelected yeah. Yeah, after yeah. that moment. So it didn't hurt him that much. Well, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, he was actually bailed out by the Russians, if you recall, at mm -hmm. that point. They mm -hmm. had cut a deal with yeah. Syria. They had Syria got rid of all its chemical weapons, so he didn't need to attack because he had succeeded. Now that, of course, is mostly fake, but nonetheless served as a useful cover, I think, at that point. Um, the uh, it's interesting. So Obama, what you know, Congress demanded that Obama give them a new AUMF draft, right? If you recall, mm -hmm. maybe 13, 15, I'm trying to remember when this was. Yeah. But I, I don't, it, it was specific authorization for ISIS. I don't think it repealed the 2001 AUMF. I'll have to go back and look at that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it did. So I think he was, he already had that in his pocket, right? And of course, you remember that the draft he proposed was attacked for being both too weak and too strong, right? It had a but, it, but who attacked it? This is an interesting thing because I think it really is aligned with what he's saying, which is the Democrats attacked it for being too strong. The Republicans attacked it for being too weak. This is for. I think it was a little more complicated. Than that. No, I, I've actually done the breakdown. It literally, it literally is Republicans attacking and saying, you, you have put constraints. Mm -hmm. We don't think you need any constraints. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, I, 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 that's, uh, yeah, right. I'm yeah. arguing the same thing. I thought right. you meant by too strong that it was too mm -hmm. limited. Right, right. And it's an I'm interesting sorry, thing because it goes to what you were saying, which is why would a president say, I'm willing to go in, but I need constraints? And why would his co-partisans agree with it? And why would the opposite opponents say, look, we're not going to vote for it unless, it's, unless you have absolute flexibility? One argument may be that it's not just they're trying to tie their hands, but 
They may also start tying my hands, and if I could tie my hands, I might tie future Republican administrations. I don't know. Yeah, I don't think they can tie it down. There's this thing that the, the decision is a hard decision. And there's costs on both sides. And I want you, dear legislator, to put your, affix your yeah. signature as well. Put it down. Because that's going to have implications downstream for the politics that are going to play out, right? When the thing, when the costs are born and your ability to come after them. That's not a story of me trying to tie my own hands and saying I can't do it. That's a, that's a story of trying to mute subsequent criticism. Put it slightly differently. It's not really trying to tie it's trying to give himself an out. Right. And this is a this is a political ploy to be able to say if this is a president who doesn't want to act when there's some public pressure to act, but he needs a plausible argument, right? And his plausible argument in public on the talk shows, whatever, is that I, you know, this is a serious problem. I have my reservations, and furthermore, I don't have authorization to do it from Congress. If Congress wants to vote it, that's fine. Of course, this involves some nose counting. So whether or not Congress is likely to go ahead and do that. If he knows that Congress isn't going to support it, then he does what Obama does with Syria. He basically says, well, I don't have congressional support, and the Brits couldn't get it in Parliament either. I'm staying out. Which he, is what I want. he never said he needed it, though. I mean, no, no that's right. Example. He never said he needed that support. He would have liked it. It would have shown national unity. I think he was trying to get people to sign on the dotted line. But uh, I think at the, I don't know, I'll have to go back and look. I think I wrote a Lucky Cage piece or something at the time that, Quoted T.S. Eliot, said he was doing the right things for the wrong reasons. Yes. Um, which, of course, Eliot said was the greatest treason. So, <laughs> so I find the argument plausible, and it it seems to me it could very well be true. The only thing is that that's not consistent with Biden's behavior on Afghanistan. He is celebrating the fact that he said no to this. He's celebrating that he had the latitude and he chose it, and so. Um, I don't think that's the, how it's like. Yeah, the latitude and the war. Interesting. Um, I know we're running perilously well on time, but Dan, I'd love to be able to get you in. Uh, just three quick right. points. First, quick addendum to what Corey said. She's right. Some, the military very often does not want to get involved in something. There is a tiny consistency issue, though, which is if they do get involved, then they flip. They don't ever want to leave somewhere. And so I think that's one of the, the sources of confusion sometimes. Because the military, like the people confuse the military as hawkish. They're not hawkish, but if they actually get involved in a conflict, then they do get pretty good. They, they don't like leaving the way they left in Afghanistan. Um, two quick questions to Will and to Annie. To, to Will, I, I'll buy the empirical argument that presidents are concerned that they don't their, their hands will be tied if, if uh, the opposition party controls Congress. But what I keep thinking about is the surge in which there was a midterm election that actually did, foreign policy did play an important role. The Democrats win that. There's that James Baker Commission, I remember, report suggesting let's get an elegant way out. And what does Bush do? Ignores all of that, does the surge, and how do Democrats respond? With nothing. You know, there was loose talk about defunding uh, the military, and it didn't happen. So they did I, pass I, legislation. What? They did pass in a cutoff. It was, it was vetoed. vetoed. And then, right, which, but that in some ways that confers my point, which is in other words, during the most unfavorable circumstances for a president to do to expand, he still got away with it. And I don't mean that in a way of like illegally. It's just that he did what he did and paid very little in the way of, of, of he wasn't constrained in the end. So I'm I'm just I'm not entirely sure I buy that argument from you. And then in terms of Annie, I, obviously I certainly embrace the idea that the resources have gone too much towards the military. But I have a provocative question. Let's say that Biden decides that, yes, our problem with, the, with foreign policy is we've given too much money to the military. I'm going to give $200 billion to the State Department. What would the State Department do with that money? Uh, would they have any operational capacity or lift to spend that wisely? You know, in other words, what is the, I guess the question is, like, what is the process by which you could actually have the State Department capable of dealing with significant amounts of money? I wouldn't. I wouldn't want the State Department to be capable of handling money. I don't think the money is the issue. There are a lot of problems in this world that aren't solved through money, and where money causes more problems, such as corruption. If you, but not even like hiring more foreign service officers. Not really. I mean, you know, we're brilliant, all, but you can blanket the world with foreign service officers. Maybe you would want to have cadres that got deeper into countries, understood languages better, that. Um, that there was a float which doesn't exist, so that when you have the when you do have a crisis, you have a, um, 
you need as diplomatic yeah, sources. But, but Matt, there's an empirical answer to this. Um, Colin Powell, Condi Rice, mm -hmm. and Hillary Clinton as secretaries of state each authorized a substantial increase in the Foreign Service to provide a training yeah. float. And in zero of three cases did the State Department create a training float. They staffed up embassies to higher levels in all three instances. Well, fair enough, although I think in zero cases, the Congress provided meaningful amounts to keep that to keep the numbers high, right? That, that this is, I, I don't know that there was enough, I mean, 200 billion, too much, but there could be a, a kind of consistent over time funding for state that, that would provide the float. But I, I, you know, I take your point that people wanted the embassies to be funded and the State Department offer, operates ha more happily on an impact uh, basis than on a plan head basis. I'm so to you so uh, ardent. I was actually supporting your point. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not the question. Maybe yeah. there's a cultural element and we have a, how, who we are and how we do our jobs. This is true. And then um, on the who wants to use their tool, by the way, yes, I think that I, I know those examples and you're right about the military saying, not us. And maybe my theory is incorrect, that it's the non-military agencies that when they sit around the table and they say, we have a problem, and each one raises their hand and say, by the way, your problem is fixed by what I do for a living. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of DOJ and all of the you know, different agencies that it represents in particular. Um, and on Congress's motive on any kind of a serious investigation, I actually think it's unsung the number of very good hearings that actually do occur uh, on issues where you know true experts sit around and talk about what policy might look like. And a lot of Congress, I think, take that responsibility very seriously, especially on brand new topics of cyber this or you know or diseases that they know they don't know about and they, they're serious about investigating. Very true to get the vice president because of that. There are some exceptions. And French Church one. Right. 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 Well, thank you all so much for uh, for another second grade panel. Uh, I don't really have anything else in terms of housekeeping because we covered it at the beginning. So just a, a big thank you to me. Uh, the last plea I'll make is uh, if you haven't given me the release just so that we can share this really fascinating conversation with more students, uh, I'd really appreciate it. But just uh, one more time, thank you all. I learned a lot. and. Uh, it was just a real pleasure to be with all of you and in person. Thank you for bringing us together.